Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, May the 5th. And as many people are celebrating Cinco de Mayo, which commemorates the Mexican Army's unlikely victory over the French in the Battle of Puebla, there's my history lesson, Colorado lawmakers are not celebrating. They are very busy working. Monday will bring the end of the Colorado legislative session and there is still a lot to attend to. For some insight into what's happening in Colorado this week, we have a strong panel of journalists, including Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Elena Alvarez, reporter with Axios Denver, Jesse Paul, legislative reporter for Colorado Sun, and Luigi Del Puerto, editor at Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette. Let's start talking about property taxes. Everyone has received their assessments in Colorado. The increases are alarming and everyone is upset and people are not happy. Patty. Well, let's see, I am doing fairly well, I guess, because mine is about 35% and there are people who've gotten up to 50% and more. What I feel the worst for are the people who are really barely hanging on. So you have a discussion of affordability. That's been the backdrop through this entire session. But political officials, lawmakers, they should have been on this long ago because the people who really are going to be suffering for an extra $100 a month, they're not going to be able to afford it, are those who've owned their houses for a long time and can't afford to go buy something else. They're lucky to have their house, but with how much houses have gone up, with the value, it's almost impossible to imagine how anybody could replace the house they currently have that they may not be able to pay par property taxes on. We've known about these problems for decades. I mean, we had first the Gallagher Amendment, which was repealed in two, three years ago, in 2020. But then we had the Tabor, Tabor, which passed 31 years ago and has created all kinds of roadblocks. We have Amendment 23 that went through to kind of counteract Tabor. We still haven't fixed those two. So here we have this complete collision course three days to settle it, somehow come up with a solution for property taxes and send it to the ballot, and then let the voters decide. I think voters would have been happy to decide five years ago. I really appreciate Kyle Clark's from Nine News' analysis on this, where he basically described this as Governor Polis essentially taking a dollar from your wallet, putting it in your pocket, and saying he's saved Colorado Coloradans money. Um, something that I'm interested in that my colleague John Frank uh, flagged, he's covering this issue really closely, is the fact that if this was fully implemented, if it passed, excuse me, um, and was fully imp implemented, local governments can still opt out without a vote from the public. So they could do that with a public hearing and a council vote. So I checked in with uh, the Denver mayor's office this morning to see where they are at, whether they would consider opting out. Um, obviously, you know, this lowering property taxes means that cities lose out on some money. Obviously, there's a safeguard in place, which we've talked about a little bit um, off offline. But um, uh, the city of Denver is not at all singing this proposal's praises, number one, and two, haven't made a decision whatsoever on whether they would opt out. They say they're trying to look at the latest changes in the bill, um, doing a lot of reviewing. But it's very, very, uh, it's, it's a huge bill, and there's a lot that still needs to be ironed out. So we'll be really interested to see how Denver and other local municipalities um, decide to respond if it passes. Jesse, how's your week been? <laughs> it's been tiring. I, I'm glad you brought this up because this is probably one of the most impactful and important parts of the bill that no one's really talking about, which is this mechanism that lets certain local uh, taxation, property tax collecting agencies cap the, the amount of property taxes they're collecting each year to inflation, but they can also opt out of it. And people aren't talking about it because it's it's insanely complicated. And who knows, you know, which uh, local governments are actually going to seize on that. So it's super fascinating. It's something that is probably one of the most impactful parts of the bill, you know, notwithstanding the assessment rate reductions or the reduction in taxable value that aspects of this bill. It's very complicated. And, and yeah, it, it's a great point. Look, the legislature waited 108 days to introduce this bill. This is a problem that we've known about since 2020 when the Gallagher Amendment was repealed. This will be the third year in a row that lawmakers are trying to reduce property tax increases on Coloradans. And again, you know, people are kind of rushing to understand a 60-page really complex piece of legislation. Counties said they were left out of the discussion. Republicans are really upset because they were left out of the discussion. And we're seeing some of these changes uh, be worked out in the final moments here. I think this will be one of those bills that kind of gets decided at maybe 11.30 p.m. As on the final day of session in a conference committee. It's something that affects all Coloradans, whether you're a renter or a property owner, super important stuff that people should be paying attention to. 
Luigi, and this would eventually be up to voters the way it is written to decide what to do? Yeah, the, the legislature has several, several mechanisms that they could have adopted to deal with rising property taxes, which everybody knew that a year ago. And many of the folks that um, are either for this legislation or against this legislation have said <coughs> months ago, deal with this problem. As Jesse mentioned, it was introduced at the 108th day. We only have a couple more days to wait for this one. One thing that I'm kind of shocked, uh, well, okay, two things I'm kind of shocked. One is that there are no valuation caps in Colorado. So whatever the market value increase of your home, that's how much, uh, that will be, you know, how much the uh, tax liability, your tax liability will be based off. The second thing I'm really kind of shocked is that the legislature doesn't deal with major things early on in the process. They wait and they're, until the very last minutes, like dropping a pretty gigantic you know, piece of legislation in everybody's laps, and then people have like a couple nights to decide what to do with it. Voters will decide uh, in November, assuming this legislation passes. I can't see in, any reason why it wouldn't go to the governor's desk, but when it does, then it you know, voters will vote uh, on this in November. Uh, the big question is what happens if voters decide to vote it down? And, and then what? You know, I wanted to play a little off here, uh, talking about the counties. The poor county, counties, first they had the election people, the denial people, they have to deal with the clerks. Now the assessor's office, they're going to have to deal with all the complaints. You've got till June 8th to go complain about your assessment. We've talked to a couple counties like, we don't even get any more of the money with these big assessments because we're capped. So we have to do all this work, listen to all these complaints, and they're going to be endless, and then be scrounging for their own cash to run their own town. So residents are complaining, they're going to these assessments. What happens, Jesse, if people were to vote it down? I asked the governor specifically, what's your plan B if this does not you know, pass the legislature or if voters decide to vote it down? And I was kind of laughed at over it. And so it, that hints to me that there is no plan B. And, and I think you know, looking at what I know about the legislature, I think they'd probably call a quick special session, reduce assessment rates temporarily, and then come back next year and, and try and figure things out. But again, if, if voters don't pass this, and, and the legislature doesn't pass it and send it to the voters. We're talking about thousands of dollars of increases for, for a lot of people across Colorado, Colorado and you know, just a lot of chaos with county assessors, people not knowing exactly what their rates are going to be going forward. It, it, this is a, a big issue. So, you know, the question that I, that I have, and maybe Jesse or, or Patty, uh, you can answer, is that um, the mechanism that they chose is to couple this with TABOR, right? So what they're doing is they're taking $167 million of TABOR refunds and, you, and giving it to homeowners, basically, is what they're doing. Everybody that's a, a, a taxpaying resident in Colorado will have to contribute so that homeowners can get this tax relief. Um, I, I always wonder, why did the legislature simply not say, hey, we're going to cut the assessment ratio, and it's a clean cut? Well, if they didn't do the taper mechanism, they effectively wouldn't have enough money to send to the local governments that are losing the revenue. So the whole idea here is to prevent local governments from taking a big hit and and what they expected to get in the increases. But certainly, it was a decision, right, to to raise the taper cap or try to raise the taper cap, and then kind of to Kyle Clark's point that I think is also getting lost in the mix is that even though people's taper refunds are going to be reduced, the net gain is going to be in the hundreds of dollars. So yeah, you're going to lose maybe fifty, sixty, even a hundred dollars depending on what your income level is in your TABOR refunds, but in exchange, you're going to save $600 on your property tax bill, so your net increase ends up being 500 If you own property, so the others aren't going to be getting the money. True. Okay. All right, let's talk about what it's been like under the Gold Dome this session. Elena Axios Denver wrote this week about the tensions that are really escalating near the end of the session, and the article pointed out how the Democrats really can't get their act together. Yeah, that's. The, I'm pretty sure that was John Brink's headline exactly. Uh, I'm parroting what he's telling me being on the ground there. But it's frantic. It's extremely tense. Uh, you have Dems on Dems filibustering each other's bills, attacking each other, starting fights with uh, Polis. And um, it's really not the environment that I think most a lot of people would expect considering the uh, democratic trifecta that Colorado has. I remember when we uh, when the session first started and I was on this table, we had talked about, you know, if they can't get things done, what is that signal for the party? Is are, is there deep, you know, dysfunction? Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that play out. Now, to be fair, they have accomplished a lot. However many bills they've passed, I, I don't know. It's so many. Um, but to Luigi's point, the fact that they are waiting 
to the last, you know, couple of days to do this big of bills, to work on these bills like this is really a uh, worrisome as, you know, a voter resident of Colorado, because what is, when you're moving this fast, it, it begs the question whether, you know, there are unidentified loopholes that could lead to um, unintended consequences, uh, which is just the inevitable, you know, it's inevitable when you're making changes right and left. So um, it's frantic mm -hmm. <laughs> to sum it all up. And Jesse, I would guess it's always frantic near the end, but how is this year different? Uh, this is the most the worst recession I think I've ever covered. In Did terms you say of, the worst? Yeah, just in terms of interpersonal conflicts. I mean, it's, wow. it's pretty nasty and, and people are pretty tense. You know, you talk to the lobby, you talk to lawmakers, everyone's kind of on edge. And we're about to head into the stretch where no one's gonna sleep for the last few days. It's gonna kind of pour gasoline on that fire. There's a lot of factors that play into this. There are a ton of new members. I think 30% of the legislature is new this year. So people are kind of trying to figure out the process. You've got a group of lawmakers who are more progressive trying to push their party in a certain direction. But I think if you look at the broad scheme of things, it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about maybe four or five bills that didn't pass. In, in the grand scheme of, you know, 300, 400 that are going to pass this year. And so, you know, some of those get the big headlines and, and the other big piece of legislation kind of fall to the wayside. So, you know, is this, was this not a productive session? I don't know. I mean, I'll let other people decide that, but I think it's, it's a few bills that they kind of grab um, the headlines or, or, or grab people's attention. And you also have to keep in mind, too, that everything wasn't going to get done in the first year of what's going to be a four-year, at least, Democratic majority coming off of the last election. There's no way in our calculations that Republicans can win back majority until the 2026 election. So that gives them three more sessions to, to get all this stuff done, work things out. And we know that one, one big piece of legislation get brought, they don't always pass in the first year. You know, you were talking about they have next year. Luigi, there were some of the progressive Democratic bills that did not make it this time, that they were really champion at the beginning. Yeah, so uh, among them, the assault weapons ban. I don't think that's going anywhere. Uh, rent control. Uh, the big one that uh, happened just a couple of days ago was this committee killing the um, uh, safe injection sites. You know, this is, uh, this is one thing that Denver wants to do. Um, the Denver needs the state legislature's permission to be able to, be able to do this one. Um, and all of these progressive ideas, I think, are, 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 they're, they're facing this really big wall. And uh, it's been difficult for them to, you know, poke a hole in that wall and, and maybe get things through, which I'm not surprised. It's just their first year. And, you know, I said, uh, you know, last time or maybe a couple times uh, or a couple weeks ago, so usually you need practice, you know, and they get better. I, I tell you what, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, they're going to get better next year. They're going to figure out how to do things. They're probably going to figure out, you know, um, how to negotiate better uh, or an, on earlier, which is key. You know, you're negotiating earlier and you can get things done. How are your thoughts on this session? Well, as I was driving here, I noticed a lot of cop cars and police right in front of the Capitol, and I was just wondering if the descent had gotten really, really ugly. But apparently it's all calm there, <laughs> and they survived the day. I mean, think about Tuesday when, once again, up rears the land, the land use bill comes back with 15 amendments that are coming out that once again is proposing, hey, the state can take control from local mu municipalities over zoning. And how upset everyone got again about a fight that they thought they'd already had and had that the governor and his supporters on that had surrendered and pulled back to just do the assessment. But I don't know, it could be dead by now, but it... It's like Lazarus. They keep rising from the dead. And if they aren't going to survive this session, we will see them again. Yeah. But I think it's been one of the ugliest ever. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anyone talk about Lazarus at the state capitol about this? No, but the bill you referenced, I have started calling the Franken bill. Because it <laughs> Same keeps thing. coming back and keeps coming back. But here's the thing about, though, I mean, Bill, I mean, you, and bill is never really dead until the session's over. Yeah. And, and, and then only until the next legislative session, right? That's right. the way it works. And, and by the way, that housing uh, land use bill. I mean, that's the governor's key signature. Uh, that's his signature you know, legislation, This, I think, this year. It would be really interesting what happens with that bill. And if it doesn't get to the governor's office, then, you know, he, this is one of the key things he mentioned in the state of the state address. We need to do something about housing. This year, Colorado's three largest cities will have new leadership voted in, and depending on how voters decide, there could be a sea change in some of those cities, like in Colorado Springs, Colorado's second largest city. Jesse, voters have their ballots in hand and have two weeks to decide who they want to lead their city. It's either unaffiliated Yemi uh, Mobilati or longtime Republican Wayne Williams. 
Yeah, I, so I went to a college at Colorado College. I, I know Colorado Springs well. It is such a different place from you know when I arrived there in August 2010. It's just completely changed electorally. The vibe down there is different. It, the economics are, are, are so much uh, different. They've changed so much. This is a really interesting election that we're watching really closely. I mean, I, this is a strong mayor system in Colorado Springs, so whoever wins this race is going to have a lot of power over you know the future of the city. And again, this is one of those places that I think is kind of like on the brink in Colorado that could grow significantly, could have you know way more economic promise, you know, change a ton, have, have a, lot of new a lot of new people move in. And, and these are two very different people. And, and if you had talked to me 10 years ago or 12 years ago about who would win this, obviously Wynn Williams would be the person that you'd look to. Really conservative stronghold, but things are changing down there. And I think whoever wins will say a lot about what the future of the city is going to look like going forward. One of the really interesting things to watch in both the Denver mayoral race and the Colorado Springs race have been kind of the endorsements and how they've fractured. And you've seen some people that I thought would maybe go and endorse Wayne Williams, the former Secretary of State, actually go uh, to Yemi. And, and we'll see. I don't know what voters are going to do down there, but we'll be watching closely. What are you watching with this race? Well, it's interesting because you get this, uh, you know, Yemi is an immigrant from West Africa and, you know, came to Colorado Springs, what, in 2010, something like that. They have really big support or, or rather went into, you know, a very close to the evangelical community. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I watched was what uh, Sally Clark is going to do. And Sally Clark endorsed Yemi. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Now, of course, the sort of the traditional thinking over there is that people are going to rally behind Wayne Williams. At the end of the day, he's going to win the race. Uh, but, you know, Mobilati got the, he, he was a top vote getter last time. I think they separated by around 10 points or something like that. So it's going to be pretty interesting. And Sally Clark was one of the contenders. Yeah, in that's the right. Last that's part. right. And yeah. very conservative, too. This is, yeah. you know, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Patty. Well, it's so fascinating because Colorado Springs in the late 80s decided one of the ways they were going to grow was to recruit churches and religious groups. And that really set the tone for 10, 20 years down there with focus on the family and those others that came in. And now you have this entirely new crew of people coming into Colorado Springs, progressives, well, almost anything is progressive compared to what Colorado Springs used to look like, but that Yemi has done as well as he has so far shows that it's an incredibly different city than it used to be, although it's still in El Paso County. So you, ha you might wind up with this very liber relatively liberal for El Paso County city surrounded by a very conservative um, rest of the population. So it's going to be th more fun than Denver to watch. I saw in a forum both of them agreed that they will not let Colorado Springs become Denver. the next Denver. Ouch, Elena. Uh, well, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. I'm not saying Colorado Springs is turning into Denver anytime soon, but I think we all hit the nail on the head here. That the tide is changing in Colorado Springs. You can see it. It's growing like crazy. Um, and the fact that uh, Yemi captured 30% of the vote among 12 candidates uh, is really, really amazing. This would be the first, if you if you were to win, it would be the first time in at least 45 years since the city had elected a mayor that has no ties to the GOP. So that's really interesting. It would also be the first uh, time the city elected a black candidate for mayor. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, reasons why this election is really interesting and matters a lot. So Colorado Springs will be voting while we're still getting our ballots out in the mail. So they're coming. We're going to talk about the Denver mayor's race now because Denver is our number one largest city in Colorado. And here we will be electing, uh, having a runoff for our mayor and for some, some city council races. And it's going to be really interesting how this runoff plays out, Luigi. Uh, it, it will be. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm closely watching is how the endorsements are lining up yeah. and what kinds of signaling the candidates are doing to segments of the population, for example. How are they courting the progressive wing of the party, for example? Now, uh, uh, Mike Johnson got the endorsement of uh, Leslie Harrod. Uh, I think that's a pretty big endorsement for him. Um, uh, 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 Kelly Broff got the endorsement of uh, Chris Hansen a couple of days ago. I think it's an important endorsement for her as well. Um, so I think that, you know, the, 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 it's a game addi addition, right? They got to grow their base. And the one section of that electorate that they're going to try and have a lock on is that progressive base. So I'm watching closely how that's going to turn. This week there was a debate regarding uh, schools, Denver Public Schools, between Kelly Ruff and Mike Johnson. Well, and of course, Denver Mayor does not oversee Denver Public Schools, but has to work with Denver Public Schools, as we saw that happen with the SROs at East High School and um, Hancock saying he would support, and the Denver Police actually providing the SROs and paying for them to go in there. 
it's fascinating. People are still so confused about, in Denver about who stands for what. And even if you got endorsements from everyone who vote, who um, ran in the last election, you have, what, 35% of the population voted for the mayor's race. Will we get more people who come out? Will someone really activate that sleepy rest of the population? Will they be able to tell the difference? I've heard from some people who say, we are voting none of the above. Mm -hmm. We cannot see any difference between these two. But I think in the next month, and that's about what we have, we will start seeing some truly negative ads that may define the difference between the two of them. So Kelly Bruff secured, uh, she's locked in law enforcement this week, so she got the endorsement from Denver's police union, and she got an endorsement from the union that represents sheriff's deputies. And on the progressive, this, so this is a huge red flag for progressives. I was talking to a few groups um, this week who are, who are saying, number one, uh, both of these candidates, well, they're trying to find someone to align with after Lisa Calderon was knocked out. And both of these candidates aren't doing a great job at appealing to progressives, but this is one way uh, that Kelly Bruff is, is pushing herself farther away from actually resonating with them. Um, so there's that. There's interesting. Jesse. Yeah, it's interesting that Lisa Calderon hasn't endorsed in this race, and I think she's told folks that she, she won't endorse one of the candidates, and that's kind of fascinating. One of the other, I know we're going to parse out endorsements here because I think they're fascinating, but, you know, Leslie Harrod endorsed Mike Johnston, Wellington Webb, who endorsed Leslie Harrod in the race, has endorsed Kelly Bra. So it's, it's, everything's kind of moving around. I was also paying attention this week uh, in Council District 9, where Candy C. DeBaca, four of her colleagues on the city council, actually endorsed her opponent in the runoff, which I thought was kind of fascinating. Uh, we've talked a lot of, at this table kind of about, um, you know, turnout and what that's going to look like. I think you're going to start seeing things heat up as voters get their ballots, just because we know that Denver voters tend to turn out or, or vote really late in the system. So if you kind of hit them or bombard them with all the messaging now, people may not be paying attention, but uh, in the next couple of weeks, I think we'll see, see things really start heating up. A, a quick question for Patty. Ma'am, how do you, uh, how much endorsement, and I ask because I'm from Arizona, and over there, endorsements don't really matter too much. There are a few endorsements. Nor does logic. <laughs> yeah. Arizona is. <laughs> so there, there are a few endorsements that matter over there. But so I'm wondering, how big are endorsements really? How, how much role do they play in the mayor's race? I actually don't think they play that big a role. What is in this race where people just can't tell the difference at all between these two candidates, I think it might be playing more. I think Federico Pena coming out from Mike Johnston kind of played to the people who thought, oh, it's time for a change. But, and maybe Leslie's more of the same. But I, I'm sorry, Kelly. But I think, um, I don't think endorsements play that much. Remember, we've got 65% of the voter, potential voters who didn't bother coming out. What is going to energize them? It's the first time in 12 years we have a new mayor. It, get out and vote, right? And Aurora, I should mention, is our third, our state's third largest city. Voters there will elect a new mayor and five city council members in November. It's going to be busy. It's a busy year for Colorado. All right, let's get to our lightning round now where each of our candidates goes each of our candidates, our <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Sorry, I give you a new job. Uh, one of our, each of our panelists go down the aisle say something good, something bad that happened this week. Patty, let's start with the not so great. You know, it's all, it's everywhere, the violence, but the random acts of violence here in yeah. Colorado, the, uh, the three 18 year olds in Jefferson County who are in court on Wednesday, the shooting, the murder at a Tesla charging station. What is going on here? They were down at Evans and Monaco, um, someone brandishing a gun in a car. People have to calm down. Patty, you're so right. I truly feel scared to drive sometimes when I see these videos. Uh, I'm going to keep mine, both of mine, sports-related. So uh, Jokic on the Nuggets, he got snubbed for a uh, third-time MVP, but I guess two is good enough. We'll take it. He's still our MVP. Uh, yeah. I'm from Philly, so I'm happy about Joel Embiid <laughs> winning the, uh, the MVP. I, I sat this week uh, in the Para Public Employees Retirement Association lobby for four and a half hours. It ended up being six hours of close executive session while I fired the executive director, Ron Baker, after they put him on a two-month leave. No one has said why, and I think it's a pretty disappointing week for transparency on that front. Para manages $66 billion plus in public employees' Uh, retirement benefits. It serves hundreds of thousands of Coloradans. I think people deserve to know what happened there. Yeah, it's just an incredibly difficult week in the state legislature and um, at follow, trying to follow all these you know, permutations of legislation has been incredibly hard. I think people are cranky over there. They get crankier every night and I think they just need to put like a, a, as, mu as many donuts as they can, candy, and distribute them to as many people as they can over there. All right, let's talk about something positive, Patty. Well, in a week when we're not feeling very positive about a lot of elected officials or would-be elected officials, there was a memorial for Pat Schroeder. And 
just to remember how transparent she was, how accessible she was. The things that she did for her constituents and for Denver, if you drive down Broadway, you see the sign on the Mayan. She was instrumental in saving the Mayan Theater, instrumental in creating the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, and just a great, truthful, fun, and feisty politician. So we need more. Uh, the University of Denver's undefeated women's lacrosse team is on its way to winning a national championship, knock on wood. They uh, kick off this weekend their quest to win the Big East tournament, so wishing them all the luck. Good. Uh, we talked about this, I think, before we started filming, but I created this tax calculator that I'm very excited about to show people how the property tax relief bill would affect them. I was always very bad at math in high school and grade school, so the fact that I was able to come up with this really made my week. I'm super excited about it. I'm allowed to, to celebrate myself every once in a while. It's awesome. <laughs> so go to the Colorado Sun and look at Jesse's article about the calculator. It'll help you figure out exactly what's going on with the property taxes. Thank you. The flowers are in bloom, and I'm just very happy to see you know, the trees are blooming, all kinds of colors everywhere. And I think it's just great. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we moved to uh, Colorado. It's just beautiful outside. I agree with you. I would like to add something positive that came out of a negative. For me this week, I had to go to a police station to file a police report. And it was unsettling to see the number of people who were in line to file a report because of crimes that happened to them, like you were saying, Patty. But the officer who was all alone at the front desk, listening to all of our stories and helping all of us one by one, was so patient and engaged. Officer Watkins must meet strangers every day, all day, who are dealing with the most difficult stuff, and she encounters them with grace and respect. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for being on this panel. Thank you all for watching on your TV or your device. Uh, you can catch Colorado Inside Out anytime on pbs12.org or YouTube and Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'm Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week right here on PBS 12.